Hello, I'm attorney Todd Leneve. Welcome to West Virginia Gun Law. In today's second part of my interview with my friend, Officer Dave Jansen, we are talking about his philosophy of policing and the importance of training in his view as it relates to how the job gets done and how it gets done effectively. And I think these are two really important, really interesting topics that give you a glimpse into the mindset of an officer who not only serves in a regular patrol capacity, but also a member of his department's special tactics unit, and how it shapes his approach to doing the job. Before we get into the video, I want to ask you again, please subscribe if you haven't yet. If you are a regular subscriber, we sure appreciate it. You guys are why the channel has had the success that it's had so far, and I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for being interested in coming along on this ride with me. Hit that like button, share the video, those kinds of things really make a big difference for the channel getting out there for the visibility because this platform certainly does not like Second Amendment oriented speech or topics and so the more we can get the viewers organically involved in looking at, watching, and sharing the content, the better off the channel is going to be and the more people are going to have an opportunity to join us in this ride. So again, thank you so much for those of you who are a part of it already. Please encourage others to subscribe and be a part of this community as it continues to grow. I really appreciate you guys. I hope you enjoy the video coming up. So let's get right into it. Stick around. Sergeant, um, you know, I, I would be lined up to test for lieutenant the next time it becomes available. Okay. I don't know if that's in my card yet or not. Right. I, don't, I don't know what my level of interest is. But, yeah, sure. you know, that being said, in working there, um, you know, even as a, as a patrol officer or a PFC, my department has offered me a lot of opportunities to go even to out-of-state training and experience how other agencies do things. Um, you know, they're actually sending me to out of state training in the very, very near future. That's to me, it's kind of a big deal. Um, but those opportunities have always been there as long as you can, you can justify them and, and show the department how it would benefit the department for you to have right. that training. Right. So. so I assume a lot of that has to come from support, not just through your chief, mm -hmm. but uh, probably through the city council and you know, those who have some oversight uh, responsibility, budgetary responsibility with yeah. the department. Yes, yeah, so my understanding is like the, the budgetary part, that would be like the city council part, so there's like X amount of dollars to play with or whatever. But, um, you know, having the support staff of like, you know, the chiefs, lieutenants, other sergeants, just basically your peers in general. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, again, showing the need for it, you know, I, our, our administration is beyond supportive. When it comes to training, you know? that's great. So, yeah, I think training is so important. I mean, it's, absolutely. You know, uh, personally, I see a lot of stuff through the course of my career that you know, say, "Man, if this guy had had a little more training in this area, you know, we might not have had the scenario that we had." Yeah. And uh, you know, it's not a knock on police, but the fact is that there are some who are not trained to do the job the way it ought to be done, and you know. I've had my share of instances uh, yeah, that have not been positive. Well, and it goes beyond just training, though. Like, you can go to training. I may have attended a training three years ago, you mm -hmm. know, but if I haven't if I haven't revisited that training or I haven't, you know, encountered a, a, a call or an experience where I had to use said training, you might get a little rusty on it. Mm -hmm. And you get into some of those law enforcement situations where you may have, you know, two seconds to make a decision, if you can't reflect back on that training, the outcome could vary greatly. Sure, you know? sure. Well, so, you know, we live in a time when, with the prevalence of video, yeah, uh, yeah. and the number of people who love to shoot video and post it, you know, mm -hmm. in some senses it's beneficial because we do see some trainable moments, some teachable yeah. moments yeah. that come out of this, but 
you know, it's also at times frustrating when you think, you know, instead of somebody sitting and filming two people beating the crap out of each other, they could have tried to step in and help separate things. I, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, getting the clicks as I sit here promoting my YouTube channel. But, <laughs> you know, a little different scenario here than watching a couple of people brawling in the street or watching something go down. Right, and, right. But so it's so easy today because we do have such prevalence of video mm -hmm. for people to armchair quarterback an officer's decision. And the reality okay. is most people have probably never been in a crisis situation mm -hmm. where you have to make a judgment like that yeah. with what limited information is in front of you. And it can be challenging. But, you know, the flip side of that is that we expect you guys as law enforcement to have the training, to have the experience, to be better positioned oh, yeah. to make those snap judgments. You know, we don't go through that training as civilians, get put into, you know, high-stress crisis situations. All right, make a decision, make a decision. You know, evaluate, analyze, and act you know, where we expect that you guys do, but I think what you've just said makes it clear that that's not always the case. Or, you know, maybe I had that kind of, you know, threat training at one point, but my gosh, it's been three years ago, and yeah. suddenly I come across a scenario where I think this guy's a threat to me, and, oh, it turns out in the end I made the wrong decision, but, you know, I didn't know. I hadn't been refreshed in my training, whatever. Mm -hmm. Hadn't dealt with it enough times to keep it sharp. Right. And, you know, I think about you know military training with you know the actual war fighters and you know, those guys are constantly training. That's Always. all they do yeah. if they're not actually fighting a war. Yeah. And it's a little bit different. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a completely different mission than what you guys have. And I think sometimes people don't understand that difference. They don't understand that you know these guys aren't every day out there, you know, throwing a flashbang through a door and going in and rescuing a hostage or whatever the case may be. You guys have a huge job, as you know, we talked about, out policing in the community, mm -hmm. building relationships. And uh, it, it's definitely a, a, a different, sometimes I think probably challenging job just because of that. You know, people oh, yeah. expect you to have that level of, you know, tier one operator precision <laughs> when, you know, the reality is, you're out dealing with somebody whose cat got stuck up a tree, and, you know, talking to them and helping them figure out how they're going to fix their problem because they had to call the police. Well, that in our ammo budget is insanely different than tier one operators. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, but yeah, you're right. I mean, everything with law enforcement, in my opinion, is basically a handshake with the community. Like, there is a partnership there when it comes to solving crimes, preventing crimes. Um, you know, the, the key point to law enforcement should be out there and, and interacting with the community. Yeah. So. Yeah. Agreed. Well, let me uh, let me sort of turn our focus here okay. um, and talk a little bit about your participation in the special tactics team yeah. uh, within your department. And you know, I think it's a good segue from where we were to understand that well, the primary job is you know being out there among the community and putting right. a good face on things and building relationships. There are times that some elevated response is necessary and having a group that's capable of providing that elevated response is a uh, you know a key component um, you know, I don't think anybody really supports the militarization of law enforcement there have a military but there are times when your basic you know road patrol officer maybe isn't equipped or doesn't have the equipment that he needs, not equipped just in terms of training, but also physically equipped to deal with certain situations. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, you you participate in your agency's special tactics unit, correct? I do. I've actually been on the team now for, I think, 12 years. Okay. 12 years. Yeah. So, so majority of the time you've been with this department. Yeah. I, uh, I was able to earn my stripes on that, you know, at a pretty early age in my career. Mm -hmm. Um, it was something I was interested in, even, again, going back to the 80s a little bit. That's yeah. when you first get that, that sparkle in your eye, you right. know. But at the same time as you get older and you mature a little bit, you start to realize that, you know, you're not going in to have a gunfight. Like, SRT's entire purpose is to try to get everybody out alive, you know, including the aggressor, right? Right. right. So, I mean, you just you want to have that, that fair and equitable ending for, for everybody if you can. Sure. Um, what, what drew you to that... Uh, that unit. 
The green pants. I really wanted a pair of those green pants. <laughs> the green pants were pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so no, actually, um, being part of special teams, like I've always enjoyed being part of special teams. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew there was going to be some kickbacks. I would get additional firearms training, which you know, I since I was this tall man, I've always been a shooter. Mm -hmm. You know, so I knew I would get additional firearms training. I knew there would be other opportunities that I could bring back to the patrol side as well. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as just different skill sets and and to help train other officers and how to deal with things such as you know, room clearing or maybe even maybe even just you know very very primitive. Uh, uh, you know, crisis interaction as far as like talking to people, trying to talk people off a ledge, so to speak. Right, right. Now, so. the, the, the unit that you are part of is not a full-time gig. Like, you're, you're a nah. patrol officer, but that's, you know, you, as is everybody on the unit. Right. When an event occurs, mm -hmm. then that's when you guys mobilize. Yeah, we get activated. Sort of pull out of the, you know, the road patrol obligations, and now you're on this particular special detail. As far as full-time teams go, there's <clears throat> very limited full-time teams, even in the United States. Most of those are going to be your larger metro departments that have uh -huh. full-time LAPD, NYPD. Okay. You know, people that have an employee <clears throat> list that are bigger than some of the populations of cities in West Virginia. Interesting. You know? um, but uh, no, we're, we're a part-time team. Uh, that being said, we're a part-time team that does... We are offered a lot of training and a lot of good training. You know, we've trained with, uh, you know, uh, Pittsburgh SWAT. We've trained with uh, L.A. County Sheriff's Office, their, their SWAT team. Hmm. Um, we've, we've really been provided a lot of good opportunities for, for good, solid training in my career here. And so you guys, you know, not only do you have that different training, I assume that's not available just to anybody. That's specifically for the team members, right? That is team, yes. And so beyond the training, I would assume that there then is some additional budgeting for tools that are necessary yeah. to carry out more yeah. specialized missions. Yeah, so I mean, you know, obviously we have tools that the patrol guys, they, they just don't get access to. Right. Um, you know, there's there's gas and, and less lethal munitions that we have access to. There's There's breaching equipment, um, there's there's a fair number of things sure, that we kind sure. of keep at our disposal. Yeah, yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't interact <clears> with <throat> it, you know, should the need on patrol arise, but that's right. it's not commonly in there. Gotcha, use. gotcha. So, with your department's unit, how often would you say, in the course of a month, do you guys get a call that requires activation of the team? Uh, so, we get limited activation. Um, we act as a support unit. As far as, like, we'll handle all the calls within my department. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's another agency that we do work with where we can act as a support role. And there's some more changes coming that I think is going to result in higher call-out uh, uh, numbers. Okay. But generally speaking, I mean, we'll do, you know, a handful of call-outs a year, really. Like, we're okay. not called out on a monthly basis. Gotcha, so, gotcha. Now, we train. We do train <laughs> at, at least once, if not twice a month. Okay. Um, and it's not just hanging out and shooting the breeze. I mean, we actually go and we'll, we'll train in, you know, combat medicine. We'll train in, you know, aerosol munitions. We'll train whatever we can train in. Mm -hmm. We will, we'll get our hands in it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so you guys stay on top of things, sort of the cutting edge as much as you can. Try to. We definitely try so, to. Okay. So. And then those handful of times that you get called out, you're good to go. Yeah.